Hello, I'm Jackie Marchington from Cordex, where I'm Director of Global Operations, and today I'm going to walk you through a forensic examination of a possibly questionable journal, possibly known as a predatory journal. First of all, disclosure statement, uh, views and opinions expressed today are mine and mine alone, um, and the, subjective, the subject of the forensic examination has been de-identified, just in case I'm wrong. Um, possibly questionable, why do I say that? Um, Predatory journals is a, coin, a phrase coined by uh, Geoffrey Beale, uh, who now who used to run a blacklist of possibly uh, predatory uh, publishers or journals. Um, the phraseology around predatory journals was questioned quite recently by um, communities such as Scholarly Kitchen, who are talking more about questionable or deceptive publishing practices rather than predatory journal practices. Uh, because it's more ab about attempts to deceive authors uh, into paying for non-existent services and attempts to deceive readers into thinking they're reading high quality uh, vetted publications. Um, so the, the side of predatory journals is, is kind of the blacklist, black hat side of the, of the uh, coin. The other side of the coin is the white hat, the good guys, uh, organisations like the Directory of Open Access Journals who attempt to vet uh, or at least hold journals to a, a technical standard uh, which then designates them as an open access journal. Um, there are, these are the criteria you need to meet to uh, become listed in the open access journal. If you're particularly good at these criteria, you get the DOAG seal. Um, so these uh, are more around good publishing practices. So about archiving, about metadata, um, about using uh, machine readable licensing, um, it encourages use of Creative Commons licences and it encourages the use of uh, the allowing uh, authors to retain the copyright without restrictions. So these, these are kind of the good guys. You may or may not be familiar with um, the, what's known as the Bohannon Sting, which was uh, take, took part back in 2013, I don't realise it was that far back actually, where um, Science uh, reporter John Bohannon uh, wrote a pretty poor manuscript with lots of flaws and obvious uh, problems with it and submitted it to 300 open access journals. Now some of these journals were on Beale's blacklist and some of these journals were on the Directory of Open Access Journals whitelist, some were on both. Um, and the outcome of the submissions was interesting in that the papers rejected, a high proportion of papers, papers were rejected um, in the green uh, portion of the, the, the middle pie chart. Um, were with the Directory of Open Access Journals. Very few of the rejections were on Beale's list, which is the orange bits. Now, the papers accepted, again, a high proportion of the acceptances were journals that were on Beale's list, the blacklist, but there were still quite a few on the white list on the Directory of Open Access Journals and some on both. Um, the rings, concentric rings, um, the outside ring, sh uh, depth of ring shows uh, substantial peer review. The middle ring shows superficial peer review and the centre ring shows uh, no peer review. So you can see some of these journals are accepted with absolutely no peer review whatsoever. The important thing from this is that there were, paper, there were journals on both the blacklist and the whitelist uh, which accepted and rejected the papers involved. Now after this, and I don't know whether it's related or not, I suspect it was, the Directory of Open Access Journals basically asked all of their members to reapply the status and they washed out a lot of journals. I don't know whether these exact ones were washed out or not, but Directive Open Access Journals has definitely sprung clean lately. Um, so we talked about blacklists, we talked about whitelists, we've shown that blacklists and whitelists don't always necessarily work. I think a, a better approach to identifying predatory journals is Think Check Submit. Um, now this is a website, it's on the slide, uh, it kind of walks you through some of the obvious things to look for for predatory journals. It has a checklist. Do any of your colleagues know the journal? Have you published there before? Can you contact the publisher? Um, is it clear what fees will be charged? What publication uh, peer review do they run? And are they a member of the obvious societies like COPE, like uh, Director of Open Access Journals, and another organisation, uh, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, which I can't pronounce the acronym, so I'm not going to try. So I think Check Submit is more of a common sense, allows you to make your own judgement about whether a journal is predatory or not. So the rest of this presentation, I'm going to walk you through uh, a journal I encountered a few years ago that I have significant suspicions about. And just to walk you through the process I went through, not using blacklists, um, I did check both blacklists and whitelists. This journal was on neither. Um, so I needed to make my own decision about it. So the proposed journal 
um, we had a manuscript that had been rejected without review four times. It hadn't even had peer review comments. It was straight in, straight out on four separate occasions. Um, we were working with a third party agency. Um, and they said, oh, we've got the journal we've published in before. It was pretty straightforward, nice, easy experience. Um, quite a low article processing charge compared with previous journals, $1,000. Not suspiciously low, but a bit lower than you used to, which kind of made me start thinking about it. And they're really quick, really rapid publication times. OK, fine, let's have a look. Had a look at the website. Very simple, which is not a crime. Um, really basic submission process. Basically, email me your article which again, not a crime, but not really what we expect to see. Um, and because I'm that way inclined, I had a look at the copyright agreement and it was an amazingly aggressive copyright agreement, not one I'd expect to see at a uh, journal. So by this point, my spidey senses were tingling and I wanted to look a little bit more deeply into this journal. So the website, simplistic, not too worried about it. There's no crime to have a straightforward website. Don't waste your money on web services when you want to do publications, that's okay. Um, submission to publication within a week and published in 24 hours of acceptance. So yeah, that's quite quick and it's in line with what most uh, predatory journals would say. Um, claims to be open access. One of the things about open access is you're not supposed to have to register or log in to read material. So it's not really open. Um, bit of a nerdy point, but again, something that made me think something's not quite right here. And a very nerdy point, uh, they talk about peer view, not peer review. Um, and the editor in me can let typos go. I mentioned the copyright transfer agreement. Uh, it reads very oddly compared with other publisher agreements. It reads more like a lawyer's uh, kind of boilerplate textbook kind of thing. You'd have a publishing agreement for like a book chapter maybe on. It was unusually hung up on graphic images. It felt it needed to point out the graphic images were part of your publication as if an academic wouldn't know that. Um, and although it says, uh, it, it acknowledges that you may be including others' graphic images in the uh, publication, and says, um, was it, uh, authors do not sell, assign, or transfer the copyrights of others' graphic images, the publisher promptly contradicts itself by saying it has to grant the publisher a non exclusive, perpetual, royalty free license to publish others' images. Now, when I see things like non exclusive, perpetual, and royalty free, that always rings bells with me as well. Um, the other weird piece of that, embargoed author reuse for six months after publication. I've never seen that in a, in a copyright transfer agreement for a journal. So I then started to look at the index claims. Um, it's indexed by Google Scholar, so what? No, no real bar to being indexed by Google Scholar. Um, it is indexed in the Online Computer Library Centre, which is the group that runs WorldCat. Uh, search that. I did find it. I also found the uh, International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology, which was the esteemed publication responsible for the Get Me Off Your Fucking Mailing List spoof. So no real bar to uh, that membership of that organisation. Scopus, not a member, couldn't check that. Um, Summoned by Serial Solutions is a library indexing tool, so why would I want, to, why would I care? Uh, Embase, it's not in there, searched it. EBSCO, not a member, couldn't check. ProQuest, searched, couldn't find it. Academic One file, the question what it was, but it wasn't in that. Uh, no, sorry, couldn't check that one. Um, business source, I don't know what it is. Why would I be interested in an academic journal indexed in business source? Current abstracts and current index to stats are both EBSCO uh, uh, lists, and I couldn't check those. Um, care, part of ProQuest, not in there. Gale are the people who provide Academic One file, which I think is a kind of uh, US university search tool for students. Um, so I couldn't check that. Um, I searched Simago, didn't find it. I searched by title, I searched by ISSN, uh, online and print, didn't find it there. So at that point, I was starting to wonder about the veracity of the claims of indexing for this particular journal as well. Um, sadly, however, unbeknownst to us, the vendor had actually gone ahead and submitted to the journal. So at this point we had some correspondence. We had an email from the publication manager at the journal to do with the handling of the paper. Um, and because I was quite interested and invested by then, I decided to uh, investigate said person on LinkedIn. So I found her profile on LinkedIn, where she is listed as publications manager. The company was different to the one publishing the journal. Um, I thought, well, people don't always keep their LinkedIn profiles up to date, no biggie. But I was interested in the company that she had been working for previously, so I had a look at that. And it was a vendor agency in the same field as the journal, 
and in the same field as the vendor agency we were working with. That's a bit strange. And then I found the vendor agency she worked for was in the suite next door to the publishing company that published the journal and that the vendor agency and the editor-in-chief of the journal were one and the same person. I thought, something fishy is definitely going on. So being even nerdier than usual, went to look to the Who Is record, which is the uh, index of the website registration, to find that the address was 2B, not 2A. So a slight difference in the address. Again, no biggie for setting up a website. You might register the domain ahead of moving into your new offices, no problem with that. But if you look at the domain name of the registrant, uh, there's a has the same name as the editor-in-chief and it's a firm of lawyers who are registered at the same suite of offices so there's now a publishing company a vendor agency and a set of lawyers at pretty much the same address operating out of those offices so I thought editor-in-chief let's have a look went to the website and searched his name and he actually popped up as an author on one of the most viewed articles so, oh, okay, um, if it's an ethical journal, this is the author, his identity has been protected. Um, let's just have a look at his paper and see what his conflict of interest statement says. Because surely, if you're publishing in a journal run by you, you'd think it would be fair to mention that? Apparently not. Author declares no competing interests. So, let's go back to think a bit for a minute, shall we? So, number one. Do you or your colleagues know the journal? Well, yes, the vendor agency knew the journal. They'd published there before, so yes, that's a tick. Can you easily identify and contact the publisher? Well, yes, they state very clearly uh, on the website who they are as publishers. Um, and we definitely contacted them by email because we had correspondence about our paper. Is the journal clear about the type of peer review it uses? It states very clearly it uses double-line peer review. Um, are articles indexed in the services that you, need, you use? That has to be a big no. Uh, is it clear what fees will be charged? Yes, they're very upfront about the fact they'll charge $1,000 and they also explain uh, that, it's to, that is there are no online, that there are no printed copies, there's no subscription fees, so it's to cover the cost of publications. Fair enough. Do you recognise the editorial board? Actually, I got bored by then, I didn't go and check them out. Um, and then the last question, is the publisher a member of a recognised industry initiative like COPE, uh, DOAG or anything? Uh, no. So, in terms of the things check submit, checklist, it's 50-50. Um, additional information we found, that there, there, there were no other publications by that publisher anywhere, despite the fact they claim to have uh, offered a portfolio of open access and semi-open access journals. I'm not quite sure what semi-open access is. Um, they're not really open access because you have to register to use the site. Uh, they don't offer CC licenses. That's not a requirement of open access, but it's encouraged. And then the nails in the coffin, uh, editorial office co-staffed by a for-profit agency in the same sector and the editor-in-chief owns uh, the journal, publishes his own journal without actually mentioning it's his own journal. So I thought that was pretty poor um, publication ethics. So from my perspective, that's case closed for me. That journal is not somewhere I'd ever recommend anyone to publish um, in, and I would discourage anyone from trying to think about it again. Um, so what was the outcome of our paper? It turned out that the turnaround times weren't particularly rapid. Um, paper was accepted. Oh. I'm surprised, given it had been rejected without review on four previous occasions. Um, the only peer review comment was a request to expand a common contraction that any peer reviewer in that field should have known. Uh, so I think that goes towards superficial or no peer review. Um, we needed to make some changes to the copyright transfer agreement um, to do with prior presentation because we presented the data at the conference previously and it was talking about uh, unique uh, presentation and that kind of thing. So a couple of things we just said, no, can we change these? Oh yeah, no worries. Completely submitted to requests. Um, again, as it's not on the CCC or CLA repertoire of journals are covered under the business license, we had to negotiate with them to allow our clients to deposit that publication in their internal library. And again, it was, yeah, fine. No, no real understanding of the question and they really didn't care. So um, my final slide, I think, sums it up. Moral of the story, it looks too good to be true that it probably is. Do you need blacklists? Do you need whitelists? Or do you need common sense? I would always encourage people to make their own decisions about the uh, veracity of a journal. So hopefully that will help you walk through some of the straightforward steps. Thank you very much.